Now on to our second essayist, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Declan Keenan, whose winning essay for 2021 was an excellent piece of scholarship and which we highly commend. Declan has an MA in Early Modern History from University College Dublin. Declan has a keen interest in and continues to research the history and cartography of early modern Ireland. And of course, it should be noted that Declan is an avid researcher and has submitted a number of essays to our previous anthologies, and we hope will continue to do so for the future going forward. So without any further ado, I shall invite Declan up to speak about his winning essay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luke. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, indeed thrilled to have recently won the uh, Irish Chiefs and Clans Prize in History for 2021. It is a very valuable competition uh, in many respects. It encourages and facil facilitates independent scholarship like myself. And in independent scholarship can be a lonely road, so it's important to keep motivating these people, you know. And for me on a personal level, it's very important, it's a very important part of my winter routine. So uh, uh, as Luke said, I have contributed over the years and uh, several times. And so indeed, it is a great honor to receive the award. And that's the real value of the competition. Uh, to, to keep independent scholars researching and motivated, I think. As such, I'd like to thank Fincher and Heron for facilitating the competition over the years. And indeed, I'd also like to mention uh, um, the judging panel, thank those. Uh, I know Dr. Captain Sims has been involved for many years in the competition as well. Um, just a bit of background on my paper. The title of the paper, uh, the 2021 paper, was an inauguration of a MacWilliam Eafter at Rao Sakura in County Mayo during the Nine Years' War. And it covered a little reported or analyzed incident that occurred there in the early stages of that war, but one which had significant consequences. The episode described in the paper occurred towards the close of December 1595 and touches on several aspects of Gaelic lordship, such as inauguration and protocol within the Gaelic and Gaelicite world, dealing with overlordship and indeed wartime diplomacy. Um, indeed, there are several le lessons from this particular episode that can be lifted into events of today. The events explored in the paper concern an inauguration of a Mac William Eachter, staged by E. Rowe O'Donnell in December 1595. The Mac William Eachter being the lineage head of the Burks and the most powerful lord in Mayo during the period. The Burke lineages in County Mayo were of Anglo-Norman de Burgo ancestry but in a period subsequent to the de Burgo civil wars became increasingly Gaelicized, adopting the customs, habits, and language of their neighboring Gaelic lineages to such an extent that by the 16th century, there was likely little difference between them and their Gaelic neighbors. Indeed, the Burks of Mayo also appear to have developed inauguration rites and procedures in a similar fashion to other Gaelic lineages and had selected a site of antiquity to undertake these procedures. The place chosen for this rite was an ancient bivalent earthen fort at Rousakira in the barony of Kilmaine in South Mayo. And that earthen fort was perhaps part or central to a preceding reeft or lordship. Indeed, open air assembly places such as mounds and ring forts were widely used in inauguration practices and ceremonies across Gaelic Ireland. These rites were likely guided by precedent or at least influenced by protocol set at the preceding inauguration at a mi minimum. The Burks, as a Gaelicized lineage, would have had to choose a place which would have lent some antiquity to their past, and they appear to have selected one at the fort at Rausakira. Several English Crown records document a couple of Burke inaugurations at Rausakira, including the one under question. Indeed, a reference in the Annals of Connacht suggests that it was an important assembly place for the Burks as early as 1333. Therefore, it is plausible that the Burks would have elected several of their chieftains, the MacWilliam Eachter, at Rausakira between the late 14th and the close of the 16th century. Their inaugurations towards the close of the 16th century were well documented by the Crown as a result of their resurgence, the, the resurgence of Gaelic customs in Mayo. The Burks were attempting to re-establish and emphasize their customs and traditions in the wake of the turmoil, turmoil brought about by the composition of Connacht. Just to touch on the composition. The Crown administration had intended that traditional titles of chieftainship and inauguration traditions along with it were to come to an end in Connacht via the 1585 tax agreement, the composition of Connacht, which was initiated some 10 years prior to the inauguration in question. The composition served to remove the customary exactions due to the magnates 
abolished traditional titles of chieftainship and signaled the commencement of English law within the province. Indeed, the composition had far-reaching comp consequences for the Gaelic excised and Gaelic septs of Mayo, as it impacted upon traditional methods of succession and resulted in the abolition of that prized title, the Machwilliam Uther. The adoption of English law in relation to succession or inheritance was significant. Under the composition, primogeniture was to replace the traditional Gaelic practice of tonistry and election, a system long since adopted by the Burks in Mayo, where once the title could be contested by any senior male member from one of the leading Burke septs, under the composition, the title and associated lands, power and benefits was transferred to the eldest son of the reigning title holder at the time of the composition. Arising from the composition, many of the disaffected Burke septs revolted from the against the crown in 1586 in response to their impoverishment. Further unrest arose in late 1588 related to the arrival of remnants of the Spanish Armada driven onto western coasts by poor weather. Some of the septs within the western baronies harbored Armada survivors, the presence of which led to open rebellion against the crown in 1589, during which the Burks once again defiantly elected a Machwilliam at Rausakira. Therefore, between the composition 1585 and the opening of the Nine Years' War, circa 1593, many of the Burke septs bore an ill disposition towards crown influence in Mayo. Just to touch on the Nine Years' War, to aid their cause in the Nine Years' War, E. O'Neill and E. Roe O'Donnell sought to create a confederacy of Irish lords, both Gaelic and Gaelicized. Their aims were multifaceted. Not only did they seek to form a national movement, but they also sought to relieve pressure on their own territories. To this end, both O'Neill and O'Donnell forged alliances with Gaelic chieftains such as Fee McHugh of Byrne in Wicklow, among others. But occasionally, they sought to install leaders in certain steps to ensure support. Internal disputes were often exploited by both leaders to nominate amenable candidates. And indeed, by 1595, O'Donnell had made several incursions into Lower Connacht, encompassing Mayo, and may have felt confident in his power to oversee the nomination of amenable Gaelic lords. Just to touch on the actual inauguration in 1595, the Gaelic Confederacy may have seen several advantages in re-establishing the MacWilliamship in Mayo, particularly given the various events following the composition. Although the title MacWilliam Uther had been abolished for some 10 years by this stage, it likely remained highly prized in memory. To this end, Eero became directly involved in Mayo politics and set about initiating an untraditional inauguration at the traditional inauguration site Sakira in 1595. Indeed, the inauguration is described in great detail in Baha e Ro O'Donnell, written by Louis O'Clary. In the Baha description, O'Donnell appears as overlord or conqueror, holding sway over a procedure that was traditionally undertaken by what was a previously strong and independent lordship to his own. In the Baha, O'Clary describes an event that was heavily marshaled by O'Donnell's troops. The inauguration site was surrounded by four lines of O'Donnell's troops, numbering 1,800 men in total. O'Donnell's own mercenaries and troops immediately surrounded the court. Outside of them was the troops of O'Doherty and O'Boyle, whom in turn were encompassed by the McSwibneys and their Galloglass. The final ring were the men of Connacht, who were to form the fourth circle. It was from within this protected mobilisation that O'Donnell invited the lords of the territories of Mayo into the fort individually, consult with them on the MacWilliam candidate. In spite of several lords opting for the senior of the Burke lineage, as would have been the custom of the territory at the time, O'Donnell selected one Theobald MacWalter Kyotok Burke. In his description of events, O'Cleary provides a hint as to the original nature and protocol of the inauguration of the Burks. It was by consultation among these and by election that a chieftain used to be inaugurated over the country. However, it is clear that O'Donnell had sidestepped that tradition of the Burke inauguration. Given the military might present and their deployment about the site, there was to be no second guessing his decision. As described above, the fourth ring around the Rath was the men of Connacht, i.e. the traditional electors and claimants, potentially limiting the access of the Burke sets and contestants to the proceedings. It was probable that there was little option but to proclaim Theobald MacWalter Kyotok as chieftain, Furthermore, it is conceivable that the selection may have been prearranged. Needless to say, O'Donnell's marshalling of a long-standing right within a traditionally independent lordship was met with considerable and immediate opposition. 
many SEPs considered there were more deserving candidates among their own. But there were perhaps several reasons as to why O'Donnell supported the suit of Theobald MacWalter Chuck and may have provided the Confederacy with several advantages if the appointment held. Indeed, Theobald's power base and lands were in the barony of Tyrolly, centred at the castle of Beleek. These lands in the northeast of the Lordship bordered the lands of Sligo, an area where O'Donnell claimed rights of overlordship. As such, Theobald's centre of power may have provided a bridgehead for the Confederacy over the River Moy into the territories of Mayo. Despite having effectively seized the chieftaincy, Theobald had a considerable pedigree in claiming that position. Theobald was a leading scion of the Schlucht Richard Burks. His grandfather, Sir John, and granduncle Richard Fitzolivus had held the MacWilliamship in preceding decades. In addition, Theobald had been imprisoned in Athlone Castle as a young man by the Crown in 1593, considering O'Donnell's own treatment and imprisonment as he, as, he, as a youth at the hands of the Crown. It may not have been as surprising that O'Donnell felt compelled to support the suit of Theobald. A brief description of the inauguration is also provided in the Annals of the Four Masters. The Annals also indicates the summons of O'Donnell to Rausakira and his selection of Theobald based on his being the first to come over to him and as he was in the bloom of his youth. Almost immediately the appointment backfired on O'Donnell. Indeed, he had travelled back to Tyr Connell with several of Theobald's competitors as hostages. Although Theobald had a reasonable pedigree, O'Donnell had selected one of the most least eligible in the accordance with the custom of the Burks of the Territories, on account of his age mainly. Despite O'Donnell's attempts to potentially secure the territories of Mayo, Theobald was never to gain great popular support from within the Burke steps of the course of the war. In fact, the affair at Rousekir merely served to bolster an almost constant opposition to O'Donnell's MacWilliam and eventually diminished the status of the MacWilliamship. So on the impacts, in the short term, O'Donnell had effectively alienated the larger portion of the Burke Seps and the Gaelic Confederacy and pushed them into making a choice between the government of the English crown or, or the overlordship of O'Donnell via an unpopular MacWilliam. It was a significant deficit for the Confederacy as there was a loss of access to many fighting men within the Burke territories who may have been once willing adherents, including one of its most effective leaders, Theobald Nilung, or Theobald of the Ships. Theobald Nilung was a, man's of mean, means of a, a man of means and ability by both land and sea. He was the son of Gráinne Niwalia and Richard O'Neillian Burke, a former MacWilliam Meifter. He was pushed beyond the reach of the Confederacy. He had reportedly access to three galleys and a mini navy comprising of a hundreds, which was a rarity in Gaelic Ireland. Theobald Nilung took it upon himself to drive MacWilliam out of Mayo upon his every incursion. As such, MacWilliam retained a weak position, met rarely with success, and was continually propped by hundreds of O'Donnell's own men over the course of the war. Each MacWilliam incursion into Mayo was met with a swift retaliation and several times MacWilliam was driven back to, to Tyrconnell, only to be reinforced and sent back. O'Donnell continually made use of Mayo as a decoy situation to divert Crown attention from other locations. Generally, most of the Burke Seps objected to the continual exploitation and depletion of their lands and livestock which, and had come to see themselves as sacrifices to the Confederacy strategy. At this stage, Mayo was generally under the control of Theobald Nilong. Ultimately, the nomination could be described as a st strategic misjudgment and only served to reduce O'Donnell's influence in Mayo as the war progressed. Furthermore, his selected MacWilliam was not a strong military leader as his sponsor. The entire lordship, which was originally disaffected with Crown government, could have possibly fallen into O'Donnell's hands with greater ease had a more se sensitive selection taken place. However, this was not to be. The matter also possibly deprived the Northern Confederacy of access to additional fighting men within the Burke territories, some of whom opposed O'Neill and O'Donnell at the Battle of Kinsale under the leadership of Theobald Nilong. Moreover, the policy may have deprived the Northern Confederacy of potential safe anchorage locations within the Burke territories, some of which may have been more suited. Northern Confederacy with some additional advantages, held a more amenable approach in adopting.
office of Rasakira. In literature on the Nine Years' War, the 1695 inauguration of Rasakira tends to be on the same as the forgotten. As for o O'Donnell's MacWilliam, he, like O'Donnell, in spite of later intrigues with Captain Thomas Lee, travelled to Spain, arriving in July 1603. MacWilliam died in Spain in 1604, never to return to his patrimony. However, MacWilliam's son, Don Balthazar, or Walter, was knighted by Philip III of Spain as the Knight of Santiago in 1607. Inter interestingly, there is a record of decree confirming the Spanish title, Marcus de Mayo, with Balthazar de Burgo MacWilliam Burke on the 21st of July, 1627. Overall, it's a, an interesting episode, and I suppose there's a few key lessons in it. The inhabitants, inhabitants of lordships tend to be very attached to their customs, rights, and protocols. And you can't just march in and usurp. There, there needs to be a sensitive approach. And um, there's a, any insensitivity can result in almost universal opposition. I think there's still many lessons in this uh, little sub-chapter, even for more current circumstances. Thank you very much. Thank you.